morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for inviting me back. It's always a pleasure to visit you, and I'm interested to see how you progress, whether this is going to become the unity of Minette, or are you going to keep it as the unity of Remington? Uh, should be interesting to see how this moves along. Uh, when I spoke here at Unity of Bremerton six months ago, I used the character of a moose, the great inscrutable and quantic moose, to uh, unravel the, the Buddhist concept of equanimity. And since then, some people have come to me and they said, okay, I get the idea. I'm going to work on my equanimity. But when I get there, then what? What comes after equanimity? I'm sure we don't stop with that. So our subject today really pertains to going beyond equanimity, trans-equanimity, or if you wish, trans-moves. <laughs> <laughs> equanimity begins with a state of mind, which then supports the other desirable states of mind in the Buddhist scheme of spiritual development, one of them being loving kindness, another one being compassion, and another one being joy. And as I like to remind people, it's joy in the good fortune of others, not your own, in the good fortune of others. So, as a state of mind, one way to look at states of mind are through brain waves, to take electroencephalograms an instrument of the mind and see what's happening there. The research goes back at least into the 1970s. Uh, Elmer and Alice Green, a husband and wife couple in Topeka, Kansas at the Manager Foundation, began instrumenting gurus and swamis of various kinds. They even went to India at one point and traveled about 7,000 miles through the back roads of India with some of their instruments uh, to find out what was going on in the minds of, of these people who seem to have some exceptional abilities, uh, but uh, could they possibly explain that in terms of what the brain was doing or not doing? And one of the ways they look at this was to look at the brain waves. Now, if you instrument your, your own mind, you will find the predominant brain wave is what we call beta. And it's a frequency of somewhere between 16 and 31 cycles per second. Uh, that seems to be where we are most of the time. But when we, when we relax and take it easy a little bit, our, our brain waves slow down and we slip into what's called alpha. And alpha is typically between 7 and 15 cycles per second. And it's possible, for example, to get instrumentation you can now attach to your computer and, and plug yourself into and you can actually keep track of where, where your, your mind is and you can train yourself with biofeedback to deliberately move your brain into alpha as a means of relaxing, as a means of, of enhancing your creativity. It's a healthy thing to do. And if you really work at it, you can go on further into what's called theta. Theta then is between four and seven cycles per second. But that is typically where you go when you are sleeping, dreaming. You go off into theta, into a different mindset altogether. And again, if you work at that, you can even train yourself to do that. Uh, that's very useful in creativity. People have, have oftentimes trained themselves to, to deliberately go into theta to solve problems in mathematics or to help them produce works of art or works of music or works of literature. So uh, these things are pretty well known. Uh, over the years, other people got the idea of instrumenting still more people. Uh, the Dalai Lama eventually convinced some Tibetan monks to come to the University of Wisconsin and to engage in further research. Now, initially, they didn't want to come. Uh, they weren't sure what this Western stuff was all about. Uh, but the Dalai Lama assured them that they would, they would not be tortured, that they would not lose what they had studied for years to attain. And, and so they came and, and were instrumented. And guess what? They found that there was yet another brain state 
<coughs> that the previous instrumentation had been able to measure. There was a higher frequency that started at 32 cycles per second and went all the way up to 150 cycles per second. And, and Albert Ellis Green in, in, in Kansas hadn't been able to measure that because their instrumentation just didn't go up there. But they found that these Buddhist monks spent a great deal of time in gamma. And that what was really interesting is that all parts of the brain, or almost all parts of the brain, were engaged in gamma all at the same time. That they, they, there was a coherence, if you will. Everything was working together instead of one going this way and one going that way and so forth. Now, the research is still going on. Uh, if you're interested, I'll, I'll give you the name of a book later that, that will describe some of the latest things that have been happening. But the interesting part of all of this is that some of the researchers themselves went off and engaged in spiritual practice so that they too, like the monks, the swamis, the gurus that they had been measuring, that they too could enter into different states of consciousness. And so what's happening now is that the researchers, other than them being hard-boiled hard scientists who were skeptical about what was happening, the researchers themselves are believers and are, are saying, okay, what's happening here? I've gone off, I've learned this, I've, I've become a Hindu, or I've, 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 I've joined unity, whatever. Uh, how is that affecting my mental state? And how does my mental state affect what happens in my spiritual belief? And, and as they go back to the early spiritual writings in India especially, they find that there are maps of the states of consciousness that are there. Uh, the Upanishads in particular spell out where the brain goes as you advance in your spiritual development or in simply your states of consciousness. The waking state that we are normally in sitting here is, is beta, but there is then dreaming sleep, the next stage, which is alpha, and then you go to dreamless sleep, which of course is theta. And these, these have been identified in Christian mysticism, they've been identified in Vedanta Hinduism, in Vajrayana Buddhism, Jewish Kabbalah. And the, in their accounts of spiritual wisdom and spiritual awakening. The Mandukya Upanishad in particular describes all of these very quickly and then adds another simply called Turiya, which means the fourth. And that's about all they can say about it is that it's the fourth, and that they can't really say that much more about it. It is indescribable. It is ineffable. One author says it is, that it is spirit, an essence so ineffable that when, one, when the seeing eye perceives it, virtually all that can be reported is that it, it is beyond, and more than all that has been encountered before. That's all they can say about it. Now, that state is what is normally called satori or samadhi. And it is effectively a goal of spiritual study that monks and swamis and gurus and mystics of all stages strive to be able to attain essentially at will. And it takes years and years and years to do that. I'll come back to more on the how in a few minutes. But it's not the ultimate. There is a state beyond that, called, uh, beyond Turiya, called Turiya Tita, where you become one with everything. You remember the Buddhist who told the hot dog maker he wanted one with everything, right? <laughs> <laughs> so you, you become one with God. It is a non-dual state of existence. Instead of you and God, it's just one, and that's all. And that's the ultimate state. That's the goal. Most, if not all, Russian traditions say that the path to this is very simple, at least to describe. Three-step path. The first step is purification. You have to purify yourself. You have to, among other things, get rid of your ego. Put it under control. And when you have done that, and only when you have done that, can you go to the next stage, which is illumination. 
or you begin to receive information in enlightened states of consciousness. And if you keep going, you then finally reach Turiya and Turiyatita, that is union. You become union with God. So basically, that's a three-step process. Now, most of us really make it all the way through purification. It's a long process. It takes years. Uh, but that's, that's the leaping off point. Houston Smith uh, was a writer on religion. Uh, he did the Bill Moyer series of the world's religions on TV many years ago and so forth. And he's my source for a number of these things because he studied all of this in, in the course of his life. He went off to Japan and studied Zen. Uh, he was the child of Methodist missionaries. He grew up in China. He had sort of a different background, but he, had, he was predisposed to, to go explore these other things in the world. And in talking with one Zen Roshi, uh, he, he was told that that Roshi had experienced Satori only three or four times in his life. And yet that was enough to make him a Zen teacher and Zen leader. So please don't expect that you're going to come out of here and sign up for a, a five-year course and, and uh, hit Turiyatita. It's not going to happen. It is a very rare occurring thing. And essentially, if you make it, you qualify for sainthood. <laughs> and I don't mean the New Orleans saints. I mean, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, th that experience was enough to convince the Roshi that there is a there there. There is something there that can be experienced and that changed the Roshi's life and, and made him aware that there is something, not necessarily an anthropomorphic being, like on the Sistine ceiling, but a spirit, a force, like gravity, or even a pervading sense of love. Cynthia Bourgeau says actually it's gravity from above, which I think is an interesting concept to think about. Gravity from above, not uh, one that pulls you down. Anyhow, the world's wisdom traditions are unanimous then in agreement that the first step is purification. It requires subjugation of the ego, which is a long and bewildering process, and the principal requirement is persistence. You've got to keep on keeping on. Now, how does this relate to states, such as alpha or theta or gamma? These are temporary. They come, they go. I'm an alpha now. Uh, maybe I'll be in beta here in a, in a few seconds. Am I going to get to gamma here? I don't think so. Not now. Not standing up here. But the research has shown that they really don't have to be temporary. That if you practice them enough and so forth, you could, they can become more, instead of traits, a state, they can become traits. They can be part of, of who you are. And again, this is effectively... What you sense when you meet then a sacred person in India or a saint or whatever it may be, that they have attained this level where they're there in this other state of mental state, but essentially all the time. That's where they are. But it takes years of, of long time meditation and practice and so forth. Um, some of the data shows that, that if you have meditated for at least 10,000 hours in your life, you will begin to really begin to progress into the beginning stages of that. Many of the Buddhist monks that, that were instrumental in the University of Wisconsin have meditated for 40,000 hours in their life. Now, if you think you've got 40,000 hours of time to, to give to that yet, you've got a good chance of making it before you die. Uh, but, but again, that's, that's what it's going to take. Actually, this kind of research has been going on, however, in a few quiet corners of the world for more than a hundred years. I'm sure many of you know William, William James, born in 1842, died in 1910. He was trained as a physician, but he never practiced medicine. He instead was a professor at Harvard. He taught anatomy, he taught psychology, and eventually he taught philosophy where he developed the philosophical perspective known as radical empiricism, another topic for another day. In uh, 1902 and three, he was invited to the University of Edinburgh to give the, the Gifford Lectures, a series of lectures that were endowed there for over a number of years. 
And that uh, provided the basis then for what he published later as a book entitled The Varieties of Religious Experience, which is a classic textbook that is still worth reading. James investigated mystical experiences throughout his life, leading him to experiment himself with substances that might possibly change his mental state. He experimented with chloral hydrate, with amyl nitrite. He experimented with nitrous oxide, better known as laughing gas. In the older days, dentists sometimes used that as anesthesia. And finally, in 1896, he took up peyote. He claimed that this was the, it was only when he was under the influence of nitrous oxide that he was able to understand Hegel, the philosopher. <laughs> As if to say, change your mental state does enhance your brain power, your brain functioning in some way. So James realized that states are naturally occurring states of consciousness, and they can also be artificially in induced via meditation or other religious practices. And so now we understand that they can result from the ingestion of certain drugs, which we would call entheogens. They, they induce experiences of God, experiences of the holy. You can take ayahuasca, you can take mescaline, peyote, psilocybin, cannabis, LSD, DMT, ketamine, fentanyl, other opioids, or even common substances like VSOP, which is to say alcohol, or LSMFT, which is to say nicotine, or high fructose corn syrup. <laughs> So now let's fast forward again to the testimony of Houston Smith. On New Year's Day, 1961, Smith and his wife ingested mescaline, which is the main substance in peyote that really gives it its kick, under the careful supervision of Timothy Leary, a Harvard professor at the time. Smith was a professor at MIT. Leary was a professor at Harvard, which is about a mile and a half down the road. And uh, they had become friends partly through a common friend, Aldous Huxley, who had written a book on the doors of perception. And so Smith was quite interested all of a sudden in, in uh, what would happen if he could, could he have some kind of a religious experience based on taking one of the entheogens that Leary was experimenting with. And so they met in Leary's living room, which is where he actually conducted much of his, his scientific research in those days. And, and Smith says that, his, uh, that this was the most powerful religious experience of his life. That this has been reproduced and, uh, and cited a number of times in the years since. It forms the basis of a book, I have it back there if you want to see it, called Cleansing the Doors of Perception, the Religious Significance of Entheogenic Plants and Chemicals. He wrote that in the year 2000. He had the experience in 1961. A lot of water went over the dam a lot of research, which he then summarized as a religious scholar who actually had not just talked about it, but walked the talk. Now, the interesting part is Smith did not become a drug junkie as a result of this experience. It was profound. It was life-changing. It changed his perception, but it also, in a sense, changed what he understood his religion to be all about. You start out as a Methodist and you wind up over here, that's pretty powerful, right? <laughs> so what he learned is that what he experienced with mescaline is closely comparable to genuine mystical experience. Closely comparable. But the pharmaceutical research and modern medicine practice has demonstrated that there are all sorts of drug experiences that have no religious significance whatsoever. So what's the difference? It depends on the particular kind of drug that you are taking, first of all. If you've ever had general anesthesia for cataract surgery, or dental surgery, or colonoscopy, I've had all of those, you've probably had some of these drugs in the cocktail that the anesthesiologist or the doctor gives to you, and even other procedures. If you've ever required sedation by the, 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 the EMT bus that hauls you off to the emergency room, you probably had ketamine. Ketamine was discovered in 1962, first tested in humans in 1964, and was approved for use in the United States in 1970. 
Shortly after that, it became the drug of choice for surgical anesthesia in Vietnam. It's on the World Health Organization's list of essential medicines, it's one, uh, which is the list of the most effective and safe medicines needed in a health system, even though it was placed on the list of controlled substances in 1999. So here we are with something, there's a list of controlled substances, but you can also get it from your local EMT if he thinks you need it to get you to the emergency room safely. Interesting. It's now available as a generic medication. The wholesale cost in the developing world is between 84 cents and $3.22 <laughs> per vial. Uh, it's not expensive. That isn't what they charge for it, but that's, that's the wholesale cost. <laughs> I've seen ads where the price was $495. Ooh, a bit of cost. Yes, we have a pharmaceutical industry. <laughs> there's, there's more. Recent medical research in the past six months has, has disclosed that, that ketamine is an effective treatment for PTSD, for obsessive compulsive disorder, for neuropathic pain such as fibromyalgia, for depression, and especially for suicidality. It's been found to be more effective than Prozac, quicker acting and more consistent results. That's dangerous. So, uh, very interesting that, that this, this drug is out there. As you might expect, ketamine is also used as a recreational drug. Some of the street names are K, Special K, Super C, Cat Valium, Jet, Super Acid, and Green. And because of its ability to cause confusion and amnesia, ketamine can leave users vulnerable to date rape. So it is commonly used out there on the streets. But to return to the basic question of religious experience, everybody seems to agree there is no such thing as the drug, ketamine, fentanyl, whatever it may be. Fentanyl, of course, is what killed Michael Jackson. Uh, there's no such thing as the drug, per se, that covers all the bases, that works for everybody all the time. Every ex experience is a mixture of three things. First of all, yes, what drug are you using? Secondly, the set, which is the psychological makeup of the person. If the person is obviously inclined to psychosis, chances are the drug is going to take them deeper into psychosis, and you may not want to mix those two. And then third, the setting. What is the social and physical environment in which the drug is taken? Are you taking it at home in your living room? Are you taking it in Timothy Leary's living room? Are you taking it in a Native American church? service. So the set and the setting are important. And Houston Smith says the research statistics are like this. One third to one fourth of the general population will have a religious experience if they take some of these drugs under conditions in which the researcher simply supports the subject but does not interfere with what is happening. The chances are 25 to 33 percent you will have such an experience. But if you have strong religious proclivities, which I presume means you because you're here, your odds go up to 75% just by the expectation of what you would have. And if you take the drugs in religious settings, such as, say, the Native American church, 90% will have the experience. So. In effect, maybe this is the placebo effect that, that you're really getting here. It's not altogether clear, but then we don't understand the placebo effect very well either. Does that mean I'm done? Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so, so you pay your money and take your choice. Before we do, however, remember Houston Smith's admonition that religion cannot be equated with, relig with religious experiences but neither can it long survive in their absence. And what we've had, frankly, frankly, is a long period where the religious experience, the mystical experience, has been dropped out of much religion. It now seems to be finding its way back, with or without the aid of drugs. And if you don't want to do drugs, then where do you go? Meditation, of course. So you pay your money and takes your choice. The risks with meditation obviously are far less. And the 
fortunately, the laws governing it are virtually non-existent, whereas with the entheogenic drugs, there are all sorts of medical laws, some of which make sense and some of which do not. So then how do we get there with meditation? Well, the, one of the Upanishads says the sequence is something like this. Step number one is awareness. You have a process of deepening self-acceptance. No judgment, just equanimity. You focus, you're focused and calm and you are observing yourself and what is happening around you. In particular, observing what is you and what is not you. So you observe your breath, you observe the rest of your body, you observe your thoughts, your mind will wander, and so you patiently keep returning to looking at yourself again. Uh, when we did Vipassana meditation, uh, the uh, uh, Esed Goenka, the guy who founded all the Vipassana centers, kept saying, start again, start again, start again. And so again, persistence is very much the quality that you need. But as you move along, you will begin to separate out what is you and what is not you. And you will begin to understand the idea of craving things that you want and aversion, things that you don't want. And of course, the Buddha says, those are the two things that are the sources of suffering, craving and aversion. And so you begin to get a handle on what really is making you tick to some extent. Then you move along having had some, some experience then of where you begin and where you end and what is really not you after all, then you begin to also understand how your being affects others and what's going on there, which leads you more into compassion. Finally, we have moved towards freedom. Once the experiences become more vivid, they also become more baffling. There is uh, what's called unknowing perplexity. And frankly, it requires equanimity to understand this. It says the answers are just not there. You have to accept that you're not going to have complete answers, but you keep on going anyhow. And step five, finally, is what's called imaginative creation. This is not problem solving. This is not doing your income tax mentally as you're meditating. It is self-creation of, again, imagining not only who you are, but who you can be, uh, that what you are becoming. Most of this is purification. It's hard to, to really sort of, in, in going through the sequence, to say this is where purification stops and illumination begins, because it, the purification melts on into illumination. So it circles around, but the main thing is that we become aware of our awareness. Think of that. We become aware that we are aware. We become aware of this thing that is watching us. It's like, uh, who's the watchbird? Who is the watchbird? Who is watching the watchbird? And, and a lot of them on that goes. So this, this eventually takes you what's called insight. And so some versions of meditation are called insight meditation. And that's really what it's all about, which is the beginning of illumination. And again, if you get this far, you should be closing in on the goal. Buddhists will tell you that the goal of, enlight of enlightenment is not happiness. Peace, maybe, or bliss, as in extreme equanimity, or detachment. Definitely, it is the end of our delusion. But it's not really joy, per se. Not really happiness. It's peace. As Houston Smith has noted, we have it on good authority that no man can see God and live. And so, in reality, you're probably not going to make it all the way, but at least you can increase your bliss by persisting in this, this meditative path. So you may ask, how do I find this path, and having found it, stay on the straight and narrow to the end? And the consensus answer is that you need a teacher. Someone who has gone before you, and knows the joys and successes and the sorrows of failure. But even that is not that simple. When the Buddha died at the age of 80 in the year 483 BC, his final words to his followers were, be lamps unto yourselves. Work out your own salvation with diligence. 
What he was saying is that the point will come where you will have to break with your teacher. That following a prescribed path will not work. This is a hard lesson for humanity to learn because when you've succeeded in attaining some measure of enlightenment after years of meditation and struggle, there's an urge to share that with others and say, here, do it this way, even to the point of forcing it on them. That's the origin of organized religion, by the way. <laughs> when we get to the admonition, which is attributed to Lin, Lin Ji Yishuan, the ninth century master who founded the Rinzai sect of Zen, he says, when you meet the Buddha on the road, kill him. <laughs> this, is a, this is a famous koan of, of Zen. Now, some of you may be aware that I wrote a book, a novel. Actually, it's a self-help book disguised as a novel, a didactic novel, one that's intended to teach. I'm of the opinion that most non-fiction self-help books never get read more than halfway through. So I read a story, part fiction, part fact, that I hope will hold the read reader's interest long enough that they will read all the way through it. One subtext of the story is that a person can perhaps stumble innocently and unintentionally on the path to enlightenment. Thus, the main character in my book almost accidentally develops a relationship with his landlord's pet duck, <laughs> Abigail, who seems to guide him intuitively as he attempts to sort out his life. And almost all my readers will tell me that Abigail is the most beloved story, character in my story. But unless they read almost all the way through to the end, they will not have discovered the secret, which I'm, which I'm now going to share with you. In chapter 79, Abigail is killed, murdered, brutally. Almost all my readers frown and say they were upset by that. I even had an email from one of you asking about that. That was my intention. A few will add that they know this is important to the, to the story and there's a lesson to be learned from it, but they can't say exactly what it is. And that's what I'm back here to share with you today. Now you know. You're supposed to kill your duck or your Buddha by gathering the courage to send a termination notice to your teacher, therapist, minister, or your resignation notice to your church, 12-step program, or discussion group, all in the name of enlightenment. You have eventually to understand that they cannot answer all of your questions, that you and you alone are responsible for your own enlightenment. But again, Remember Houston Smith's admonition, religion cannot be equated with religious experiences, but neither can it sur survive long in their absence. So you'd have to completely send in your permanent resignation notice. Just don't, e don't expect the teacher to do it for you. You have to work it out for yourself. So what to do? Is there anything beyond all this, say trans enlightenment? Well, here's what one psychoanalyst, Sheldon Kopp, wrote in a book in 1972, there's some sexist language of that era, so I apologize for that. His book was entitled, If You Meet the Buddha on the Road, Kill Him. This is a psychoanalyst writing. Everything is just what it seems to be. This is it. There are no hidden meanings. Before he is enlightened, a man gets up each morning to spend his day tending his fields returns home to eat his supper, goes to bed, makes love to his woman, and falls asleep. But once he has attained attain enlightenment, then a man gets up each morning to spend the day tending his fields, returns home to eat his supper, goes to bed, makes love to his woman, and falls asleep. Mm. Once a patient realizes that he has no disease and so can never be cured, he might as well terminate his treatment. He may have been put in touch with the good things in himself. He may even be, still be benefiting from the relationship with the therapist. But once he realizes that he can t continue as a disciple in psychotherapy forever, only then can he see the absurdity of remaining a patient, and only then does he feel free to leave. We must each give up the master without giving up the search. If no one is really any bigger than anyone else, to whom can we then turn? If we are each equally weak and equally strong, as good or as bad as one another, then what is left to us? We must learn that each of our lives can itself become a spiritual pilgrimage, an exile searching without end. And our only comfort on this lonely journey is that for each man, it is the same. 
as uh, Lily Tomlin said, we're all in this alone. <laughs> <laughs> For meditation, uh, I, I have a brief musical selection designed to help take you into alpha. So for about the next five minutes, close your eyes, <coughs> relax, and just let the music take you by the empty out as much as you can. That will give you a small taste of bliss. <laughs> and you get the ball from there. Parting thought from Plato in the Phaedrus a couple thousand years ago. The greatest of blessings come to us through madness when it is sent as a gift of the gods. Heaven sent madness is superior to man made sanity.
You can remember that the next time the robocall comes. Oh. <laughs>